Welcome, caring viewers, to planet Earth, our loving home. To raise awareness of the profound and devastating environmental effects of livestock raising, the UK-based non-profit group Compassion in World Farming hosted a lecture and panel discussion on the topic in London, England. The event, held in September 2008, brought together over 400 participants from government, the diplomatic sector, think tanks and research organisations. Panel participants featured Dr. Henning Steinfeld, Chief Livestock Specialist of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and co-author of the well-known 2006 United Nations Report, Livestock's Long Shadow, Environmental Issues and Options. The panel also included Dr. Robert Watson, Chief Scientist of Britain's Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Felicity Lawrence, British author of best-selling books on the food industry, Professor John Poles, Senior Lecturer in Public Health Medicine at Cambridge University, England, and Compassion in World Farming's farm animal welfare expert, Joyce De Silva. The lecture entitled, Global Warning, the Impact of Meat Production and Consumption on Climate Change, was given by the esteemed Dr. Rajendra Pachari, Chair of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and a vegetarian. Media reports on the role of meat consumption in driving climate change have increased significantly since Dr. Pachari's call in 2008 for the world to eat less meat to counter global warming. In honor of Earth Day, we now feature excerpts from Dr. Pachari's compelling talk. What I'm going to do to start with is um, give you a few um, major findings from the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, and then I'll deal with the subject of consumption of meat and its uh, role in um, contributing to emissions of greenhouse gases, and then talk about a few means by which we should bring about a reduction. This is just a view of uh, changes that have taken place, and these are observed changes in global average temperature, global average sea level, and northern hemisphere snow cover. And you'd notice over here that uh, this record of temperature changes, starting with uh, the beginning of industrialization, has had obvious ups and downs, and that's essentially because changes have taken place both as a result of natural factors as well as human-induced factors. But what is particularly significant is that in recent decades, you see that the increase in temperature has been much steeper than in previous decades. And therefore, uh, and I'll say a little more about this later, it's largely the result of human uh, contributions to the concentration of greenhouse gases that you find this uh, rapid increase in temperatures that's taken place in recent decades. And if one looks at the total increase, the average increase during the 20th century, it amounted to about 0.74 degrees Celsius. Corresponding to that, the middle diagram gives you global average sea level changes. And this, if I might mention, during the 20th century amounted to about 17 centimeters. Now, you could say 17 centimeters is not a lot, but if you are living in the Maldive Islands or, you know, on the low-lying country of Bangladesh, then 17 centimeters, which is pretty close to a foot, is really a lot. You don't even have to wait till inundation of that entire land area takes place as a result of sea level rise. But purely because of coastal uh, flooding, because of storm surges, cyclones, there would be much greater devastation that would uh, take place on account of a higher sea. Northern Hemisphere snow cover has been going down, and uh, you see this particularly in the case of uh, the Arctic region, which is warming at about twice the rate of the rest of the globe. Now, in the fourth assessment report, we've uh, come up with projections of temperature increases by the end of this century. And naturally, based on scenarios of economic growth, technology changes, and other factors, there's a whole range of outcomes that one can project. And corresponding to that, we get a range of these temperature increases by the end of the century, right from 1.1 .1 
degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees Celsius. But we've come up with two so-called best estimates, one at the lower end, which we estimated at 1.8 degrees Celsius, and at the upper end, about 4 degrees Celsius. I might say that even the 1.8 degree Celsius increase does uh, provide some cause for alarm, because that combined with the 0.74 degree increase that took place in the 20th century would add up to over 2.5 degrees Celsius. And in looking at the impacts of climate change, we have now come to the conclusion that a 2.5 degree increase in temperature will cause impacts that clearly would be quite unacceptable on any basis whatsoever, particularly on the basis of equity, because uh, some of the worst affected regions in the world are those that are hardly responsible for having caused the problem. And these are regions where you have widespread poverty. There's absolutely no infrastructure or, uh, or capacity by which they might be able to withstand the impacts of climate change. So the point I'm trying to make is that we really have to do something about the current trends and we have to bring about some major changes by which we can take care of the future of this planet. You are watching Planet Earth, our loving home, on Supreme Master Television. Please stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Planet Earth, our loving home, on Supreme Master Television. We are listening to portions of a lecture entitled Global Warning, the Impact of Meat Production and Consumption on Climate Change, given by Dr. Rajendra Pachari, Head of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in London, England. The talk was presented at a conference on the environmental effects of livestock raising, sponsored by the UK non-profit group Compassion in World Farming. This gives you a picture of the way emissions have grown since the 1970s. And of course, it's obvious that the largest source of increase has been from CO2 emissions uh, based on the use of fossil fuels. Uh, there is, of course, also an increase uh, in other sources of carbon dioxide, like deforestation, which is quite considerable, uh, decay of organic matter and peat and so on. And then you have other gases like methane and N2O from agriculture and others. Now, if one wants to get into further detail on how much of these emissions are accounted for from production of meat, then we would really have to look at some numbers that I'd like to place before you. Unfortunately, the growth in global daily availability of calories per capita has not resolved food insecurity and malnutrition in poor countries, and in fact has increased pressure on the environment. Now, in recent months, as you're aware, there's been a substantial increase in food prices. And for some countries and societies where almost 80 to 90% of the household income goes for buying food, uh, this really spells disaster. And as a result, we've had demonstrations, we've had protests in several parts of the world. But what is particularly uh, sad is the fact that decades of effort to wipe out poverty have really been washed out by what has happened in recent months. So uh, it's important for us to understand the inequitable and unequal nature of distribution of food, even though in the aggregate the world is now consuming a huge quantity of calories, uh, both in per capita as well as aggregate terms, uh, its uh, distribution leaves much to be desired. And during the last four decades, agricultural land gained almost 500 million hectares from forests and other land uses. Uh, recently, I was uh, in Brazil about two months ago, and uh, I uh, was invited to speak at the Senate over there. And uh, Madame Marina Silva, who used to be the Minister of the Environment, and other senators 
told me that they're really concerned about the rate at which deforestation of the Amazon region took place last year. It seems to be increasing year after year. So, I mean, what we have to worry about is uh, clearing of forest land for uh, agriculture and related purposes. An additional 500 million hectares is projected to be converted into agriculture in the period up to 2020, mostly in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. If we look at accounting of emissions from agriculture, basically uh, from livestock production, we have 80% of the emissions, total emissions from agriculture being accounted for by livestock production. It amounts to 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions, which is shown over here. And I'm using data that's been provided by the FAO. Since people found out about uh, this talk that I was going to give here today, I've received a number of emails from people that I respect saying that the 18% figure is an underestimate. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a low estimate, and in actual fact, it's much higher. If we look at um, the proportion of greenhouse gas emissions from different parts of livestock production, a good part comes from deforestation and desertification, about 35.4% than the manure, both direct and indirect, because do remember that a large part of food grain production goes into feeding animals that are essentially used for meat. And there's enteric fermentation, which is also quite large, 25%, and uh, other sources, all of which is shown over here in broad terms. Now, producing one kilogram of beef, I believe, leads to emissions of greenhouse gases with a warming potential equivalent to 36.4 kilograms of CO2. It releases fertilizing compounds equivalent to 340 grams of sulfur dioxide and 59 grams of phosphate. It consumes 169 megajoules of energy. And one kilogram of beef is responsible for the equivalent of the amount of CO2 emitted by the average European driver per car for every 250 kilometers. And it burns enough energy to light a 100 watt bulb for 20 days. Now, again, let's look at the inequity of the situation. And I'll say a little more about this later. There are 1.6 billion people in this world who don't have access to electricity and have never possessed a single light bulb in their homes. And that, to me, is a huge tragedy, placed as we are in the 21st century. So I'm not saying that a reduction in emissions over here will translate into lighting of the homes of people who don't have electricity today, but uh, it just brings out the stark contrast between the situation in uh, prosperous societies and those that are really deprived. Thank you for being with us today on Planet Earth, our loving home. Please tune in again next week for part two of our program featuring Dr. Pachauri's talk on the major role of livestock raising in producing climate change. Up next is enlightening entertainment after noteworthy news, so please stay tuned. We wish you and all other beings on the planet a very happy Earth Day 2009. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash P E.